Welcome to module one. In this module, we are looking at regional integration in Africa. I'm going to present to you an overview of regional integration on the continent. I'm going to explain to you the importance of regional integration, how it can actually serve as an avenue for Africa's development. We are going to review the functioning of the main regional blocks on the continent, take stock of the achievements and failures. Uh, we are going to critically assess the status of regional integration at the continental level. And finally, we'll talk about the process leading to the EFCFT agreement. Let us start with a definition of regional integration. What is a regional integration arrangement? What is a regional trade agreement or an RTA? Basically, it's an arrangement between two or more countries to cooperate through formal regional rules and institutions. The objectives can be several. I have listed here some of them. Uh, for example, to overcome barriers to the flow of goods, services, capital, and movement of people across borders. It, another objective could be to manage uh, shared resources or to achieve peace and security in the region. So these are just some of the objectives behind regional trade arrangements. There are other objectives. Uh, all of these may apply, some of these may apply, or any combination of these may apply to specific uh, RTAs. RTAs may be motivated by dynamic economic, political, and other strategic factors. Uh, we are going to look at some of these factors at work uh, in Africa. In terms of the process of regional integration, I think the reference here is uh, Bela Balassa. Uh, in 1961, one of his uh, seminal um, pieces of research talks about five stages of regional integration, as you can see on the next slide. The most basic, the very first of these stages involves the formation of a free trade area. That is the lowest in terms of complexity, it is the simplest uh, free trade, um, regional trade arrangement. In, a, in an FTA, basically, you have a group of countries that come together and they agree to substantially liberalize trade between themselves, while each country retains uh, freedom in terms of how it is going to trade uh, other countries, that is, countries that are not part of the FTA. The next step, the next phase, which involves a progression over an FTA, is a customs mm -hmm. union. So the customs mm -hmm. union basically is a free trade area plus a common external tariff. So basically now you have a... So let me start from the customs union point, okay? So the, the, next, the next stage uh, in the process is the customs union. In a customs union, uh, you have uh, the countries that are party to the free trade uh, area, they agree on a set of common external tariffs. So in a sense, a customs union is a free trade area plus a common external tariff. A common market goes a step further. It involves the formation of a customs union plus, plus measures taken, policies, uh, uh, taken agreements made to promote the free movement of capital, services, as well as people. In an economic union, the countries, the parties to the agreement uh, agree on macroeconomic convergence. They agree on a common set of uh, macroeconomic policies, fiscal and monetary policies. And finally, a political union, which is the ultimate stage in the process of regional integration, that involves a common government. In the real world, you have uh, regional integration arrangements, which span the entire spectrum, as we see here. Um, there are customs union, the European Union itself is uh, perhaps a combination of an economic union and a political union. It, it, some people may not describe it as a political union as such. A political union perhaps is the United States of America, okay? Uh, if you look at all these states, uh, the federal government, the central government, 
uh, they use a common currency and all that, that may be regarded as a political union. The European Union is more of an economic union towards going perhaps towards a political union. As you can see, Africa, we are still at the level of a free trade area at the continental level. Uh, the next step is to move for a customs union and then to gravitate uh, through these steps to ultimately reach the goal of a of an economic and monetary union. Please, in the number of regional economic uh, arrangements notified to the WTO. As of 2019, that is last year, more than 300 RTAs were in force. What explains this uh, exponential increase in regionalism? You can see it from the graph. Okay, especially starting uh, the 1990s, you can see a sharp increase in the number of RTAs that were notified to the WTO. There have been several explanations put forward for this increase, for this rise of regionalism. Uh, one of the earlier theories uh, came from Baldwin. Baldwin talks in terms of the domino theory of regionalism. So basically, he's argumented that uh, when NAFTA was formed in 1994, so NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Area, which comprises the United States, Mexico, and Canada, when, when that agreement was formed, obviously it involved the United States, it involved another major partner, Canada. So many countries felt that they were not, uh, they were left uh, aside, in other words, they, 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 they didn't participate in this agreement. So it created, the formation of NAFTA created what Baldwin calls pressures for inclusion. In other words, countries that did not belong to NAFTA, they wanted to form regional trade arrangements of their own. So that led to a sort of a scramble on the part of other countries to join together into uh, similar arrangements. Another explanation has been put forward by Bhagwati. Bhagwati talks in terms of uh, the spaghetti ball. So spaghetti ball basically means a situation where uh, the same country belongs to more than one RTA. So uh, another name for the spaghetti ball actually is uh, overlapping, overlapping membership. So countries belong to uh, different RTAs. Even in Africa, you have many countries belonging to uh, different uh, regional economic communities, as we are going to talk about them later, or uh, regional trade arrangements. So uh, there may be many reasons behind behind this, this choice. Some countries want to get the best of what different RTAs offer. So in this, uh, in the attempt to actually maximize the benefits, uh, they actually join different RTAs. Obviously that creates uh, complications, uh, complications when it, com it comes to uh, implementation. Mansfield has emphasized uh, a number of political factors that could explain this rise of regionalism. Uh, political factors like democracies. Democracies have a tendency to, uh, to, to, to work together, to collaborate. Uh, so that could explain also uh, this increase in RTAs as we have uh, seen it, especially uh, since the 1990s. And one of the uh, most recent explanations that have been provided come from uh, what are called gravity models. And these models basically uh, talk about, uh, they talk about many things, but one of the uh, important ideas coming from the gravity models is the so-called natural trading partner hypothesis. So basically here the idea is that countries have a tendency to to join together and form RTAs because they are geographically close to each other, because they share a common border, because they share transboundary, trans, uh, tra transborder infrastructure, common language, because they have the same kind of colonial heritage. So basically, uh, affinities that actually uh, attract countries into this kind of RTAs. Let's talk about the importance of regional integration. I think it's very important that we understand why in Africa we see such a sort of fervent 
uh, uh, effort towards regional integration. And this is not new. It's been there for, for many, many years, uh, going back perhaps as far, if not earlier, than the Abuja Treaty. And, and we're going to talk about this as we go along. So there are various channels through which regional integration can affect economic performance. That is the reason why countries are so keen on uh, agree on, 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 on signing regional trade agreements, uh, regional integration agreements. They want to reap the economic benefits that come from these agreements. They want to reap also the political uh, benefits. I think we mentioned some of the political benefits, peace and security, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, and, and the idea of cooperation, the idea of uh, diplomacy, uh, those obviously are important political uh, advantages. But let us focus here on the economic benefits that follow from regional integration. Uh, the first thing that we um, I need to point out, and you can see it from the from the chart. On this chart, on the vertical axis, you have the annual change in merchandise exports as a percentage of GDP. So basically, on the vertical axis, you have the growth in trade. On the horizontal axis, you have the growth in GDP per capita. So basically, the rate of economic growth. Okay, and each dot there is a country. So here you have a scatter plot of countries, okay? And what do we see? We see, uh, if you were to sort of plot a line through this scatter plot, you will see inevitably a positive uh, correlation between uh, trade and GDP growth. That's a correlation. And that this correlation is clear from from the chart. But Frankel and Roma, uh, they have gone further. They actually have uh, shown, they have developed a theory which argues that uh, it's not just a simple correlation between trade and growth, but actually trade causes growth. So they establish a clear direction of causality whereby trade is driving growth. So trade causes growth. And, and, and following Franklin and Roma, there has been a number of empirical studies that have uh, obviously investigated this relationship between trade and growth. Uh, and by and large, those studies conclude that uh, trade is strongly correlated with economic growth. Countries that are more open tend to grow faster. That is the bottom line of the research. In Africa, one paper I can cite, uh, a research one, uh, is a paper uh, that looks at the relationship between trade and growth in ECOWAS countries. And uh, one conclusion coming from that uh, paper is, and I have uh, quoted it there, uh, exports were consistently positively related to growth. So I think, uh, it is, we just have to trust the, uh, the, 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 the accumulated evidence, which strongly suggests that there is a robust relationship between trade and growth, and that trade actually drives growth. So if trade drives growth, and if regional integration boosts, can boost trade, then you have a relationship running from regional integration to economic growth. So regional integration arrangements uh, liberalize trade, trade liberalization lead to greater flows of trade, and that is what eventually leads to growth. There's also a relationship between trade and poverty. Uh, that literature, again, it's a, it's a huge literature. If you really are interested, uh, you may refer to uh, the study by Winters and but to Sully in 2014, it's a recent study. And they basically make the point that trade liberalization is good for poverty reduction. So at the end of the day, we can summarize this strand of literature by saying that if trade is good for growth, and if growth is good for poverty reduction, then trade must also be good for poverty reduction. And that is what Dollar and Cray 
uh, talk about in their 2004 paper. 